Well, welcome to open house or closed house, as I suppose it is at the moment. Um, as you can see, we're in a very warm and slightly strange place at this time of year, but this is essentially our Great Hall roof. Um, it's not really generally open to the public, it's a very difficult place to access, but it's a really interesting aspect of the Tudor element of what is Fulham Palace. So a Great Hall is uh, one of the most significant buildings in any kind of Tudor uh, palace, as it were, and ours is no exception. We've had dendrochronology done on it, and from that we understand that the timber was felled in 1493, um, which is an early Tudor building, if you get the period of Henry VII there, and it is um, a beautiful piece of classic Tudor kind of carpentry. Um, the one slight issue that we've had with our hall is that in the 1750s, Bishop Sherlock decided to raise the ceiling. So to a certain extent, it has been messed around with quite a lot. And you can see bits that don't quite fit together particularly well and that are slightly awkward. But it draws very similar and very strong comparisons with the timber roof that we see um, on the Tudor arch side of the courtyard that um, I've recorded videos on previously and which are on YouTube. Um, but obviously being the Great Hall, it's much wider and much grander and there are some seriously chunky pieces of lovely timber up here. Again, I think most of it is probably elm. There is an element of oak, hence how we've got the dendrochronological date. Um, but um, Fulham was known to have been very heavily forested with elm at the time, so it would have been very easily an accessible timber for the bishop to use, especially seeing it was actually his own timber. But the main things that you can see here are these huge main rafters that run up right up to the ceiling. And unlike the Tudor arch side of it, it's double purlin because it's a much wider roof. Um, so we have two rows of purlins linking into those um, principal rafters. And again, the beautiful wind braces that we see again on the other side, but again, two rows of these. Now, because it's been messed around with, with the raising of the roof, some of those wind braces have gone, they've been chopped out, and we can see various bits of timber that have been cut away. But the skeletal elements of it are still there. The other thing that's really interesting to note when you're up here is the, the, the sort of normal rafters, as you can see. Um, and we know that they're the same date as the principal rafters and that they're made of the same wood. But interestingly, in the Tudor period, they laid their rafters on side rather than on edge, which is what we do now. And you can see the current roof behind it, again, which is probably 19th century, with kind of the rafters there, nowhere near as fancy and nowhere near as chunky, but laid on side. The other thing that you'll note when you're up here is the, um, the daub that you can see sort of separating various elements of the, the roof. Now the daub is exactly what we see throughout the palace when we get those Tudor elements still existing. You've got kind of mortise and tenon timbers going upright and then in between those you have the staves and laths and then the daub. This is again lime washed giving it that kind of colour. Now, most of the daub is actually missing up here, and in fact, we have more on the Tudor arch side of the building. But we know from the parliamentary survey of 1647 that there were rooms up here because it records two large rooms in the roof space with two smaller rooms on either side. So again, we've got to imagine that this roof space was occupied back then and it was being used. There were probably dormer windows, which would have given it a bit of light. And the chimney is at the kind of the sort of northern end of the, um, of the hall, which would again would have given some heat. But you can see obviously there are still sort of mortise and tenon joints in the timber but they've now been removed probably when the roof was uh, the ceiling below was raised but essentially the main elements of this beautiful structure they're still here and it is rather a magnificent thing to see when you're thinking about carpentry taking place nearly 500 years ago so this is the king post um, the central post and they're running right down the middle in the other um, sides of the the palace where we've still got the tudor roof we have queen posts so you'll have one post on either side and they're called queen posts whereas the king post is the one that runs straight down the center and you can see they've got these lovely chamfered edges here they've definitely been messed around with though um, post 1750 and you can see these timbers on either side they're not original at all um, but there's been a kind of vague effort to make it look kind of as it would have done i suppose but yeah i mean it must have been a very interesting place to be particularly when there were there were rooms being used up here we, we've got no idea what they were being used for but um yeah, just like a, a really interesting a interesting spot. So if there's anybody's interested in what these black and white squares are, they are survey points, and they've been put up when a survey of the roof was done, and the whole point is that you can come back and check them, make sure they haven't moved location, and that the roof is stable. 
because if they start to move, then we know we've got a problem. Hi, I'm Paul Smith, caretaker at Fulham Palace. Looking after the clock here today in the tower. It's all run by hand, so it's all wound up by hand. All the mechanisms, the cables, all work the clock. It lasts for up to about eight days once fully wound. As you can see, we've got the weights here that actually will drop every single minute. And that drops right away down inside the tower. Once it reaches the eight days, it has a weight limit on it that will then cut out the clock and the clock will then stop. On the on our left hand side here, we have the hour, which the hour weights are actually do exactly the same thing and then just all the pendulums and the clogs are all kept in pristine condition so the clock keeps chiming every day and the pendulum you have to push have back to, and forth by hand you have to set once the clock has stopped you have to set the pendulum by hand so it's all about timing to get the actual right weight you can't push it too fast if you push it too fast the clock will then overrun that is spectacular thank you Paul you're welcome that is it It was made by Edmund Howard in Chelsea. It was refurbished and refixed in 1956. My wonderful clock. <laughs> <laughs> You have to have aspects of the time, so you have to look at the clock before, if it stopped, you have to look at the clock before you come up, because you won't know what time, ain't got no time on the, on the actual dial. That's so funny. It's just got the, it's just got the minutes, so you got keep one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, it's just got five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty, five, thirty, thirty, five, forty, forty, five, fifty, fifty, five, sixty. Oh my god. So if you don't know what hour it's on, you ain't got a clue. <laughs> So you have to look at the clock to see what time the see what time it is. See what time it is so you can so, work so, so you need a, a modern clock to do your tutor work, do you? Yeah. Oh. So this is this is the bell wire. What we sh what we saw from inside now comes outside on the hour. That pulls, a, that pulls a wire and then the hammer goes down on the bell. Hello, I'm Lucy Hart, head gardener here at Fulham Palace. 
Welcome to the digital open house session. Today I'm going to show you some behind the scenes areas in the garden that nobody really goes in uh, except if you work here. So we've got behind the vinery in the bothies, in the, both, in the vinery itself um, and I'm going to tell you a bit about, about that area. But for now, as you can see, I'm standing in front of our iconic Tudor walled garden entrance here. And this wall is Tudor. Um, however, the walled garden itself is actually late 18th century. It was Bishop Terrick who commissioned the garden to be built in 1766-67 and um, was quite clever in utilising an existing Tudor wall. So it was then that the garden became a garden this way rather than a garden facing this way as it was originally with the Tudor wall. So the garden is about three and a half acres and when the bishop was living here at that time the whole three and a half acres would have been put over for produce growing to serve the house because the bishop would have ate every night and had guests every evening. Now we grow produce in there in an eighth of that and that is plenty. Um, we sell our produce on a barrow and we uh, manage the garden um, with our amazing volunteers and our group of um, our team of garden staff including three apprentices. Um, we grow lots of flowers, fruit, veg, wool trained fruit trees and of course if you've been here before you would have seen the amazing wisteria which sections off the, the, the knot garden. So this up here used to be Bishop Fitzjames's plaque, his coat of arms, um, but originally it was on the other side of the entrance because the garden was facing, was going down to the palace and we also know that because the bee bowls, which are these ledges on the walls, are on this side of the wall so it would have been for bees to pollinate whatever what was growing inside here. It wasn't until the garden was built in the late 18th century that the plaque was then put on this side. So this is the, our potting shed and this is part of the garden bodies which are north facing so they're very cool and when they were built in the 1830s um, they were used as the garden rooms for the gardeners, the working rooms and of course the cool and um, dark atmosphere would have been great for storing fruit and also one of these rooms we know actually grew mushrooms. But today we have it as our potting shed. When I first um, started nine years ago, these rooms were being completely renovated um, and there was nothing in here at all. But this lent itself to being our potting shed because we could have this great long bench here so we can get lots of volunteers working along. So now we're standing in the vinery, which is based in the wall garden, and this was originally what's called a pinery vinery. So it was built in the 1830s, around we think, under Bishop Blomfield, um, and it would have been the exact same shape and on the exact same footprint as what we see today, except slightly extended on either side. But it was specifically to grow pineapples and grapevines. So you would have had the pineapples growing in heated beds, heated from fresh horse manure, because they wouldn't have had, um, of course, any electricity back then. Um, and then the vines would have grown up here, um, so the two seem to work together well. Um, we still have these, these black um, pipes, they are also original, we're keeping these just for cosmetic value really, they don't work, they were linked to the boiler room which is in the bothies. So this was a slightly, uh, possibly later um, type of heating that was here and now we have this, these electric heaters. But um, So we now use this glass house area, as you can see, growing tomatoes and glass house pro produce, uh, cucumbers, we grow melons, we've grown aubergines, cucumelons, um, and they love the heat. This is absolutely bang on south facing, so I've seen the thermometer off the scale many times, even in September when we get a hot summer, a hot late summer, you can still get above 50 degrees in here, which is quite tricky to work in but um, the plants love it 
um, and we of course sell our fruit and our produce again on our little barrow and I'm always getting asked what are these so people see these kind of tea bag things hanging on all the plants and these arrive every so often every kind of month or six weeks and they are live insects live predatory insects and they are especially all, um, especially planned to predate what what pests we have in here so we have aphids mealybugs scarid fly um, white fly and each insect i mean this for example is a um parasitic wasp which will come out of a tiny hole here it's got oats inside to keep it fed whilst in transit it will come out and it will hunt our aphids and then it lays eggs inside them without them knowing and then the eggs hatch and eat them inside out <laughs> love that bit <laughs> So that works brilliantly because um, we don't use chemicals here and we, you know, we use organic growing techniques. We have got an ambition um, to grow vines and the pineapples as, as they once did. However, it is a lot of work um, and uh, I mean famously Heligan Gardens grew a pineapple using the fresh horse manure and one pineapple with all the labour involved they actually um, priced it as being £18,000 for one, one pineapple so but it would be fun to do um, so that might be something we, we think about just to you know since we've got an amazing vinery but for now growing um, the fruit does, does really well um, and uh, yeah it's a wonderful um, glass house to work in so we grow these marigolds in here for display of course but um, also for companion planting these marigolds they have a very pungent oily fragrance um, I love it but aphids hate it they hate the smell of it so it's really as an you know another element of organic gardening trying to um, control the pests in here so this new aluminium glass house was built on the same exact footprint as the original one between 2010 and 2012. It was part of the Phase 2 National Heritage Lottery funding project that was a joint project with Bishop's Park and it was um, the project that really kick-started the garden um, because before now, before then, the glass house was completely derelict broken timbers, broken panes, um, and it was completely boarded up. It was a real shame. So um, the phase two project um, took all that away and put this um, metal frame glass house on now, um, and also gave us this opportunity to have this as a visitor area under normal circumstances, um, but to have display beds here. And as part of the phase three project, where we focus very much on Bishop Compton, um, which we carried out in 2019, um, we've been doing some extensive research on what plants Bishop Compton grew when he was here between 1675 and 1713. And some of those plants are planted out in the Compton borders, which many visitors may have seen. However, some were quite tender to grow. So I have um, allocated these two beds as the Compton plants. And you can see he was collecting things like these wonderful lavenders, lots of South African species, pelagoniums, um, and we've got um, other lavenders and margaritas from Canary Islands. So um, not only did he have a big, um, a lot of um, connections in North America, um, where his missionaries were sending plant material back to him. He also had connections within Europe, um, and he, he did hold um, a large Pelagonian collection at the time when he was here. So this is the east side of the glass house, the vinery, and this is um, close to the public at all times because this is our growing on space um, and where we use it to grow our seeds, our cuttings, um, keep things protected whilst um, it's winter and then the tender stuff can go outside in the summer. Here, this, um, this mat is all due to be changed, actually, just the top bit of it, but this is a large heated mat. So in spring, this is completely full. In fact, the whole glass is full to the brim of little annual seedlings of vegetable plants and cut flower plants um, and things to sell on the barrow. Um, but we always make sure there's a lot of space, or perhaps more than one, spaces for Edmund, our cat, who you must have seen. Um, he has various homes. There's one of 
his castles in the box or he doesn't mind just being on the, the mat you know on its own because it's a lovely heated mat that keeps him warm all day and all night in the winter and you will never see him off it um, when it's cold outside um, it's off right now um, of course during the heat wave um, but uh, what we do is we cover the seeds um, with these propagation lids um, for a couple of reasons to keep the humidity um, with around surrounding the seed but also to stop the mice from um, eating them once they've already been sown which is rather annoying um, but um, <clears throat> Oh, we have lots of pelagoniums growing on in here. We do pelagonium cuttings and then we put displays around on the window sills. We're just sorting them all out at the moment, making sure they're labelled properly. Um, but uh, soon this place will fill up again with our autumn biennial plants ready to sell next year. This is our mess room, which would have been used by the um, people, the family that may have lived here. There was a family that once lived here back in the 19th century to keep the fire going, to keep the boiler stoked, to keep the glass house warm. Um, however, this is now our garden staff mess room um, and uh, we use log burners to keep warm in the winter because um, there's no other heating. Um, uh, and um, we, of course we're able to use the, the wood that we um, manage over the, 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 the year. Um, we collect it and we have a, we use one of the rooms as a log, log store. Um, and it does really well, it keeps us ni nice and cosy in here when we're having our lunch and tea. Um, but one thing it's really lovely to think about how these buildings were originally used for the gardeners and then of course they became very um they weren't maintained and they became very dilapidated and dangerous and now the restoration has kind of brought the gardens reunited the gardens team back with the, this area so I, I find that I think that's really special that we're using the the buildings for what they were kind of originally intended for so this is just one of the images um, that shows the garden bothies before they were restored in 2010 to 12. Um, and here we have, this is the original head gardener's office, which is a very small space, um, and these steps going up. And if I just take it away, there we have the original head gardener's office, which is my cupboard office now, and there's the steps.